that is so easy to see the world as a spectacular place as a child. It's a lot harder after you've gone through hard stuff. But the kind of people that are able to see the world as a magical, adventurous place while also realizing and knowing deeply and intimately how just terrible it can be sometimes, those are heroes. Welcome back to The Legacy Show. I am your host, Nick Sales. Today we have a very special guest on. This is my best friend. He was also the best man at my wedding, my best friend, <laughs> Levi Harris. Okay, yes, yeah. thank you for being here. I did a good job, right? You As did. The best man. You did do a good job. Uh, it's funny because on my wedding day, him and a, a few of my other friends showed up with a bunch of weapons. And we're, ta we're not talking like guns or anything. We're talking swords yep we're talking spears yep. we're talking uh, i think there was a, a tennis racket i think so a baseball bat uh, knives assorted knives things yes. adventure weapons but we're not like talking short knives we're talking like big machete knives yeah and they come up with just like a car <laughs> full of these weapons and you know i i it, that would probably surprise anyone. It, it didn't surprise me because I, I knew them, but we ended up making a, a fun little video with all of those weapons where we charged and everybody had a weapon. True. And it was a Sometimes you just, you know, big life events require swords. That's I, a, one I of the agree. lessons I've learned in I life. I agree. <laughs> Yeah, so Levi and I, we have a friend group where it is a very odd and bizarre group of people. We get together and we uh, go on, an, on these adventures. We have gone treasure hunting. We have gone looking for dragons. True. Uh, we have gone looking for, for ghosts or aliens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and so that's kind of the first question that I wanted to ask you, Levi, is how did you get to be this type of person who loves adventures and who hmm. loves exploring, who loves doing all of these crazy things. I feel like most people would just be totally content sitting at home watching Netflix or playing video yeah, games absolutely. or maybe even just like playing basketball. What is it about adventures or exploring or hunting for mythological creatures that kind of just like makes you infatuated with this? Uh, that is such a good question. Um, you know, I think that adventure on its own had it became a part of my identity. Um, beginning in childhood, developing as I became older. Um, and it started with just my imagination when I was young, like reading books. I read so many books when I was younger and watching movies and, and hearing stories and you know, all that sort of stuff. You, you sort of have this moment where you're sponge as a kid and you take everything in and then you get to decide um, how much, how, how much that stuff's going to be a part of your life when you get older. So I think that there was a point where I realized I needed to grow up because that's what society says. But then I realized that growing up could be on my own terms. I could decide what being a grown up meant. And instead of putting away the dreams of my childhood, it was a moment where I was actually able to give power to the dreams of my childhood. So like the things that I had dreamed about, I could now actually do them as an adult. They weren't just stories. They weren't just things I would hear about. I could actually, um, I could actually do it. And I think, I think it started with the Forest Fen treasure. If you remember, um, this guy hid you know, a whole bunch of gold in a chest in the Rocky Mountains and wrote a poem about it. And he said, whoever finds it can keep it. And uh, I remember seeing that when I was maybe 21. I saw an article about people looking for it and I realized I was like, oh, th these aren't just stories. This is, this is real. I could actually have adventures in my life, you know? And so adventure has become kind of a philosophy for me uh, that I try to search for adventure every day. Big ones, small ones, adventures all around us. So there was a pretty great adventure that both you and I were a part of at around the same time. Levi and I actually lived in Colombia for two years yep, we did. Uh, for, for our LDS missions. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because we knew each other a little bit before our missions, but on the mission is really the, the time when we really got to know each other. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, he would live in one city. I'd live in another city about every month or so. We would get together for leadership uh -huh. conferences and yeah. we would basically <laughs> just talk to each other and tell each other the stories of the different adventures that we, that we had there. There was one adventure in particular that I remember you told me <laughs> that I just remember thinking like, how in the world did this actually happen? How was this actually possible? I'd yeah. love for you to retell that story of what happened cool. to you in Colombia. Um, yeah, I'll try to give a not too long version because it was a couple weeks long sort of thing. Um, Colombia, bless its heart as a country, is so beautiful, so wonderful. The people are so spectacular there, but it's had a lot of issues politically and stuff pretty much ever since it was founded. There's, there's always something going on. So <laughs> there was this time where um, in Colombia, everybody went on strike, essentially because they're importing a lot of goods and not using native Colombian goods. So they had a strike and pretty much overnight, I don't, I don't know if you remember, it was amazing. They shut down every major highway in the country overnight. I do remember. They like 
parked giant trucks or burned things of tires and you couldn't you couldn't go anywhere me and my companion at the time were um, leaders of a zone um, is what you call it and the zone stretched it, it was it was kind of big like to get from one end to the other it was like maybe 20 hours in a bus hmm. um, and it's kind of windy through the jungle and stuff so we every month were supposed to visit each of the groups of missionaries we hadn't done it that month and then this rolled around this this thing happened and everything was shut down and i look at my companion i'm like we should probably just stay here and he's like yeah we probably should and i'm like but we're not going to are we he's like no we're gonna go visit the mission <laughs> yeah I, well i remember because the, the the mission president he told us you need to stay in your apartments you can't leave because we had heard stories that people were throwing <laughs> grenades in the city centers people yeah. were throwing rocks through windows uh -huh. it was a really dangerous <laughs> time for missionaries and so we weren't allowed to leave our apartments but that didn't hold you back well we also before it got too bad we were already out so it was like when it was starting we're like okay something's happening but i feel really good about going and i talked to the mission president and i was like we're thinking of still doing our exchanges and he goes Elder Harris, I don't know if you remember how he talked, but that's how he talked. <laughs> he goes, Elder Harris, just be smart and be safe. And I hung up with him. I looked at my companion and I said, let's do this. <laughs> so um, we hitchhiked for about two weeks through the Colombian uh, countryside. We hid in the backs of trucks to get past like certain mobs of people. I mean, we, uh, we got all of them. We visited all the missionaries in our zone over the course of a couple of weeks the missionaries we lived with in the in the house thought we were dead because we had no way to contact them their phone was dead well we only have one phone for the whole house oh, so I see. they were just inside um but yeah we went out and we hitchhiked to different places i remember um at one point we were hiding in the back of this truck to get through this roadblock and uh, they stopped us the, the, tr the truck was delivering food to an orphanage and they stopped us and they took everybody down for the truck and i suddenly found myself in the middle of just a mob of like 500 people and they were like masked up and they had uh, like weapons and rocks and everything. Well, and a little side note about this. Uh, the, the reason for the strike is that uh, Americans were able to sell milk and food and, and other groceries yeah, yeah. to Colombia <laughs> for a cheaper price than what the Colombian farmers themselves were willing to sell those products for. Yeah. So at that time, the Colombian people had a little bit of a spite towards Americans yes. because they wanted their own farmers <laughs> to be able to sell the, the, pro the goods and services in, instead of America. Yeah, that's a really good... Um, a really good uh, thing to mention because being American and you've seen missionaries I don't I didn't look like how I look now I mean clean cut short hair as American as you can be yep. you stick out yep. like a, I was in white shirt and tie totally you were probably in places you were the only American in that whole town I was and you know I was I mean? the tallest person probably, probably twice as country. tall as everybody else yeah, yeah. and so <laughs> and we're wearing white shirts and ties um, so they pull us down from this uh, this truck and we're just in the middle of like 500 people who are threatening us and they started saying things like we know who you are you're the cia you're americans and i'm like what no we're just missionaries we love jesus we're here to talk about jesus yeah. and uh they were like no we're gonna take you and in that moment i was like oh no i decide i wasn't scared for my life i was scared that i disappointed the mission president because i was gonna get kidnapped i was like he told me the last thing he said was to be safe and i'm gonna get kidnapped right now um and it was just after this like crazy week of just finding the perfect situations to get around the country and missionaries were getting tear gassed out of their apartments and all these other things that we're having to deal with. It was kind of ground zero for the strike was the part of Columbia that I was mm. in. Anyway, um, I just remember this moment where I felt like we needed to go a certain direction. I grabbed my companion and I was like, we're going this way. And it was weird <laughs> because as soon as I kind of was like, we need to go this direction, the group of people just parted ways and they're like, all right, you can go. And we're like, well, I'm not going to ask twice. And we walked like 20 miles to the next town um, and uh, ended up at the very end, getting back to our original city with the help of a member and his bodyguard and armored car because he happened to have one. He was the only person in that part of Columbia that probably did. And he happened to be um, one of the members of the church where we were. And so he got us home and we didn't die. But I was so embarrassed that we were in so much danger that I didn't tell the mission president. I told his wife everything. And I was like, she'll tell him. And then uh, at the next leadership council, he comes up to me, he puts his hand on my shoulder and he goes, Elder Indiana Jones Harris. And I'm like, there it is. I can die. Yeah. That's the... 
that so was, anyway, yeah, it was, it was, that was, was kind of crazy. A crazy time in the mission. I remember the mission president <laughs> saying that if the strike would have happened, I think it was just for a few more days, the church was going to send in Black Hawk helicopters to Columbia to they, pick up they all had, the They had helicopters ready to go to pull us out of there. Um, I talked to somebody that was in the offices later who told me some of those things about um, they were ready for it to get really crazy because they it, it got to the point where the protests had, you know, just like huge groups of people and tanks and all of these other things that were going on in the government against the protest. Yeah, it was a, it was, it was a crazy time, but I also feel like it was part of what I, that sounds kind of weird. It was part of what I was there to do because I wasn't there to go on this crazy international sort of adventure, you know, with my companion and hide in the back of, of, of trucks and get through mobs safely and avoid danger. But what I was there was to, to visit the missionaries in my zone, make sure they were all right. And I was able to do that. And so like, that was one of the lessons where I felt like the universe and God was telling me to be like, Hey, just so you know, adventure is part of your life too. Like you're here for a very special calling and purpose, but I want you to know that for the rest of your life, you will lead an adventurous life. And this is sort of training for that. And I, I don't know, is this weird? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But it was this feeling that I had at the end of, of my mission that it was only the beginning of my adventures, which have, you know, that's not, uh, it's not the craziest thing that has ever happened to me. It had been at that point, but since then I've, I've sort of, I don't know, it's given me the skills to safely navigate through the uh, some of the more dangerous or crazy things that have happened to me since yeah. then. I don't know if that. Yeah, totally. Sense. I mean, I remember one time you and I were walking on the streets of Columbia together. We were going on a, in a exchange where we were companions for the day. And I just remember we were walking on the streets of Columbia and we were just like, what, what are we doing? <laughs> like we are two gringos, two North Americans walking the streets of Columbia, this third world country. True. Nobody here really knows us. <laughs> What is happening? Like what yeah. got us to this point? It was just such a totally. bizarre feeling. And the, but a cool feeling because I, I feel like there's been a lot of times probably since then that you've been on a shoot somewhere or able to be a part of a situation where you're just like, wow, I, don't, I never envisioned I would be doing something this cool. But it's because again, that call to adventure that is a part of stories, but I think happens in real life. I think that you're the kind of person that answers that call. And I've tried to be the kind of person that answers that call. So I think that's what it is. You know, we went to Columbia for two years to serve the people and that was an adventure. And we decided to listen to that call to adventure. You yeah. know, it doesn't have to be Gandalf or Obi-Wan Kenobi right. or Hagrid. Right. It, sometimes in our life, it's, it's, they're there, but they're a little more subtle, I think. So there's a very specific part of adventuring that you're pretty obsessed with right now and something that I want to ask you more about, <laughs> okay. and that is treasure hunting. Okay, yeah, treasure hunting. <laughs> uh, right, right now, I think that we are on kind of a treasure hunting kick. We kind of are, as a friend group. Right, uh -huh. yeah. Spe <laughs> specifically with treasure in the ocean from shipwrecks, and we're, we're really wanting to plan a trip to Florida, bring yep. underwater metal detectors, bring you know spear guns, totally. scuba gear, and, and go out because... Ethically. And, we're going to ethically right, treasure yeah. That's an important part of it. Be because in Florida, can you explain kind of how like when the hurricanes come in, it kind of, you know. Yeah, yeah. So so over the last couple hundred years, um, for a long time, the Florida, the, the Atlantic side of the Florida coast has been a place where a lot of ships have, have run aground. We're talking all sorts of ships, but a lot of them have been treasure ships. Because back in the day when, um, you know, Europe was kind of coming in and sort of taking stuff from America and sadly brutalizing the people here. It, they would take massive sums of gold and silver and other things, and not all the ships would make it back. So one of the places where that happened a lot was on the coast of Florida. And uh, Nuestra Señora de la Tocha is a specific wreck that was just filled with gold. And this guy named Mel Fisher found it um, back in the day and just like millions and millions of dollars of gold. And that's just one of like t many, many ships that have run aground there. And it's only about a hundred feet out from shore in 15 feet deep of water that they're finding this stuff. And it's, uh, you know, you need special permits and permission and stuff like that to do so. But people are finding stuff because the monsoon season will, I don't know if monsoon season or hurricane or whatever it is in Florida mm -hmm. will stir everything up and kind of keep this yearly wrote like, like yearly disturbance going so that stuff doesn't stay buried for a long time. Mm -hmm. Each year there's the potential that stuff will be washed up and brought closer to shore. So, there's always the opportunity to go find something. And people find stuff there. Yeah. They find gold coins. They find 
pieces of shipwrecks, stuff like that. It's super cool. There's a supposed treasure pretty close to where we live. Uh, in fact, a treasure that you've written a whole book about, <laughs> or, or several books, I, I think. Yeah, definitely one. Definitely one book that's been published anyway, and then some other writings that I have secretly stowed away. <laughs> but we won't talk about that. The, yeah, well, tell, tell me a little bit about that treasure, about the curse behind it, about yeah. some of the crazy things that have happened there. I mean, we could talk for hours about that, but I'll give a, a short... Um, Summary, uh, Three Lakes Ranch is a ranch in Kanab, Utah. Um, and it is supposedly the burial place of Montezuma's treasure. So Montezuma, who lived in uh, Tecnoclitan in, in Mexico when Cortez came and, and the Spanish and the Aztecs fought. Um, the legend is that the Spanish saw rooms full of gold. And then bef when, when they left um, and then when all the fighting happened, they came back, those rooms were empty. And so the legend is that that treasure was taken somewhere. Now, I don't know if that's the source of whatever's at Three Lakes Ranch, but I'm convinced there is something there because of some of the stories that I've uh, looked into. It's a lake, and at the bottom of this lake, apparently there is or was a tunnel, which might be buried over now. Um, and that tunnel went back into a cavern, which is about 80 feet below the cliff on the side, um, and several other chambers that's just supposedly full of gold. And they've drilled in, and on the drill bit was flakes of gold. And so they've detected stuff down there with ground penetrating radar. So all, all the stories are in the book. And I've, you know, interviewed the first hand accounts of those stories. And there's just like a little too much evidence for there to be nothing, in my opinion. Now, of course, we'll never know until somebody is able to get in there, but nobody's been able to access the treasure because supposedly it's cursed, right? And they the say it's curse. cursed by the Aztecs. Yes. Um, but some weird stuff has happened. Like the scuba divers have tried going into the tunnel and they've had their scuba gear turned off, their oxygen turned off. And we're not talking about like bumping it against something. It takes like eight, you know, Turns twists hand. to turn that stuff yeah. off. And it happened to them several times. Somebody had their whole wetsuit ripped off of them, people getting scratches and everything. And of course people get scared and when they get paranoid, you know, your, your mind plays tricks on you and you see things in the water, but like there's some legitimately weird stuff that went down mm. at that place. Uh, well, the, what's the, what's the curse that happened with the drill? The drill was going yeah. down. And so the drill bit I talked about, they got, had the flakes of, of gold that night. The, the driller guy went home and had a heart attack and he was like young. He was mm. like in his forties. Um, and they said, well, it's the curse. And then, uh, lawn child is the guy that I talked to who kind of grew up there. Uh, his father, Brant child's the one who, bought the property and, and Brant died in a car accident um, in 2002, I think. And actually now the place was sold and is owned by Best Friends Animal Society, uh, which maybe we won't talk about Best Friends Animal Society on this podcast, but there's <laughs> an interesting it's, history it's, there. There's a whole the other podcast yeah. that we can talk about just about that. But it's, re it's really interesting because that's a treasure I heard about a long time ago. And I was like, man, I wonder if I can figure out anything about this. And at that time, Lawn Child was like, I would love to talk to Lawn Child someday, but he's been on the History Channel, Discovery Channel, and then uh, I just got a hold of him, and we're actually great friends now. He calls me about once a month just to give me updates on stuff because he's trying to get the land back eventually, and he said if he does that I have full permission that I'm the one person on the face of this earth that he said could just go after the treasure if he wants. So, well, speaking of that, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there in the myth and the legend of this treasure, don't, didn't the ancient Aztecs say that the only person that could access it was like the chosen one? Yeah. So there is a legend that, uh, they say, and, and I'm not sure where this legend comes from because, you know, you have Aztec records that Bernal Diaz kind of wrote back in Cortez's day that there's not a lot there. Um, but there's like some rumors of stuff. And then you have all the folk tales, right? Of like a guy named Freddy Crystal in 1920 who came and found a map and he found this map in Mexico in an old Spanish mission and led him straight to Johnson Canyon, which is one Canyon over from three lakes. And that he found a cave and excavated this cave, which you can go visit today. Um, and it had been buried and sealed up and that inside this cave, there were like clues to the next stuff. And eventually it leads to three lakes. Um, but yeah, one of the legends that has been talked about, and there's not a lot of sources, I've tried tracking it down, but it's kind of ambiguous, is that, uh, oh, you know what? I actually remember what it was. It was when Lon was digging for the treasure, um, a, an individual, a Native American individual in classic Native American garb showed up on his property. 
randomly and said, the treasure's down there. We know it's down there, um, but it's not for you. It's for the chosen one of the tribes who will use the treasure to unite the tribes and uh, kind of return this ancestral land to those that it belongs to, that it that deserve, you know, that eventually that originally lived here. So that's where the mm-hmm. most of the story comes from. But they always said chosen ones, which I found was interesting. Um, and that story is Lon says after the individual left, he followed the footprints and they just ended. And it's like a desert out there, so wow. they don't know where it went. Wow. That's one of the fun stories that he told us. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the chosen ones. So going back to Columbia, you, you said that up until that point, that was the crazy ex- experience that you had had up until that point. Let's hear some of the other crazy experiences uh, we've had since then. Cool. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you a selection of adventures, if that's okay. Great. Yeah. Um, this one highlights just, uh, you know, I went to Peru in 2019 with my friend. We were young at the time and, uh, you know, early mid twenties, young, um, and we, <laughs> we were four years old, yeah, yeah, four, <laughs> you know, young in my mind, but, uh, uh, we went to Peru for a couple of weeks and I have some friends there from that I met in Columbia and we were kind of wanting to treasure hunt or whatever. And, uh, I just like this story because it kind of highlights some of the adventure, like, I guess, hmm, what do I want to call it? It highlights adventure, like values, like being bold and not being afraid. Um, and so we were in Cusco and I just went to the Ministerio de Cultura, which is what oversees the archeology. span And I'm like, you know what? I'm in Cusco. I might never come back here. I'm not gonna be embarrassed or afraid. And I just walked right up the stairs where I probably wasn't supposed to go into one of the offices. And I looked at the lady at the desk and I said, hi, I'm a writer, cause I am. And I said, I'm working on a book, which uh, I planned on it at the time. <laughs> I said, I would really like to see some archeological sites here in Peru, if you know any archeologists. And she's like, oh, you're a writer. I'm like, yeah, yeah, and I'm working on a project. I don't know if that's possible. She's like, no, 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 I know a guy. Let me call him. And she just rings him up. And as she's ringing him up, she goes, I'm gonna tell him you're really famous. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> and she says, hey, yeah, do you know, you know? And he says, yeah, have him call me or whatever. Um, the next day, so I went to a payphone because my phone didn't work there, and uh, called this guy up, and he's just like, "Yeah, I'll meet you tomorrow." Now, my friend was that I was with was going to Machu Picchu, and I'm like, "Am I really going to not go to Machu Picchu and stay here to potentially talk to an archaeologist to maybe see an archaeological site?" Right? Um, but it felt like what I needed to do, and I'll I'll go see Machu Picchu someday. So my friend leaves. I meet this archaeologist. I talk to him. I'm like, "I want to see a site." He's like, "I don't have any digs currently, but my friend does." Let me, uh, let me call him and he calls him and, I'm, and, and as it's ringing, same thing, he goes, I'm going to tell him we're really good friends. And I'm like, like, I didn't ask anybody to say this, but, uh, he says, Hey, I have a famous writer here and he wants to see one of your sites. Can he come tomorrow? And he's like, Oh yeah, have him come on down. It's a closed site. It's not open to the public, but have him come on down. So the next day we go. And at this point I'm with a Chilean geologist and a, <laughs> a witch from Germany that I met at the hostel and I brought them along with me. And I say witch just because she, you know, pagan and, and practices that stuff. She's very, very sweet. Um, we go to this site. It's this massive city. It's huge. It's called Pikiakta. And uh, we had passed by like the outer edge of it earlier in the trip. But we went there and the, the like for two hours, these archaeologists giving us this in-depth tour and like the significance of this city and that it was a, is a spiritual city and that it may have even been the capital of the Incas before Cusco because of certain artifacts that they found and just like all of this crazy stuff. And then, uh, yeah, all because I just decided to be bold and walk into, into there. We had this like huge in-depth, you know, tour of this place that I never would have been able to see. Not open to the public. It's still not open to the public. And uh, just this ancient city out way out there in Peru. And uh, yeah, that, that trip was important because like I, I had always kind of had the desire to do stuff like that and wondered if I could and to see it in practice that it actually works. Same thing happened on the way back. There was a museum in Lima that was closed because they were doing archeological archeological digs underneath the museum. I knocked on the door. I said, hey, I'm a writer. I'm writing a book. I know you're closed. Is there any way we can get inside? Um, we're leaving tomorrow, uh, flying back to America. And they're like, yeah, yeah, come on in. And we got a tour through this museum while they're digging it up. And they told us about like what they were finding underneath it and everything all because like I decided to knock on the door. I could have just said, Oh, they're closed. I'm going to leave. And 
that's the thing is that they could have said no and I would have been in the same position, but they said yes. And you never know when somebody's going to say yes. So you may as well be a little vulnerable and put yourself out there. And then we got to Florida and it was when Hurricane Irma was happening and they left us there and we had to do this crazy cross country road trip with a guy that we met and uh, drive across the country back to Utah. But yeah, it was just a really, really good high adventure experience and and that was uh important at that time of life for me to be able to to do that i guess <laughs> i think you bring up a really interesting point that has to do with confidence now you know this this podcast is called the legacy show it's all about building legacies yeah. and i think that having that kind of level of confidence is a really important aspect of building that legacy because to build a legacy you have to get out of your comfort zone. Totally. You have to do things that allow you to be vulnerable. Absolutely. You have to approach people and you maybe have to ask uncomfortable questions, mm -hmm. but what, what, is, what is the payout of that? What the, I mean, obviously the result is more than you could have ever asked for. Yeah. And you know, I think humans, you know, we're on kind of this trajectory to be better, right? We always want to be better. We always want to discover new things and new technologies and help people who are in pain and bring justice to people and create a society in which you know we we don't just survive but we thrive as a species right and so i think that like if you keep doing the same stuff that we've always done we're going to keep being the society that we've always been and so if you just decide that you're going to be the kind of person then instead of living just what society tells you to do what's the norm if you're going to live true to what's inside even if that's different that's when things start happening because we need more people to really think about that and to really look inside themselves and think, who am I? What do I have to offer to the world? Why is my story important? And why is telling that story going to be important? Because I think every single human that's on this earth, they have a reason to be here right now. And maybe that reason isn't going to be to save the earth from nuclear annihilation or aliens or something you know that we see in movies, but in your own way, are you going to be the hero of your story? You know what I mean? Because so many people aren't, they're just side characters. Hmm. And I think that's more of a tragedy than if you happen to be the villain of your own story. You know, I think, uh, I think complacency is a type of death because life seems long when we're in the middle of it, but it is incredibly short and blinks by and flashes by. And, and it's a, you know, it's, it's something to savor. It's something to take advantage of it's something to live to explore to adventure through you know i'd love to hear a little bit more about that specifically for for you uh, i want to hear more about the legacy that you want to build the legacy that you want to leave behind what you want to be known for mm -hmm. the, the good that you want to do in the world what is it about you know being the hero of your own story that inspires you and and how do you see that happening in your life i think being the hero of your own story doesn't need to mean anything huge or grandiose but I think it requires bravery to be able to say, I'm, I am going to do who I am in this life, you know? And uh, I think that because that was such an important thing for me, I want to help other people do that. Um, and I feel called to kind of be a hero maker, you know what I mean? To, to help people realize like your story is not somebody else's story. It's not gonna look anything like somebody else's story. And that's the important part, it's different. Because ever since the beginning of time, humans have been telling stories about ordinary average people who listen to the call to adventure and go do extraordinary things. And the point of that story is to, to reveal to them that they were never average in the first place. They were, they were extraordinary all along. And I think that's true of each individual human. So I think that, you know, with the different things that I am trying to do in my life, um, through the creative things that I'm trying to do and and through even just my daily interactions with people, I think what I would most like to leave on the earth is the idea that each human being has a story that's worth telling and a story that's worth being the hero of. And it doesn't matter who you are and where you come from or how much bad has happened or how many people don't want to hear your story or how unaccepted that story may feel. It's important. It's vital. And each human being is an extremely important part in the grand design of the universe, and we can't do it without you. And if there was any message that I would want to continue after I'm gone, it would be that there are no extra parts in this universe, that everybody belongs 
that everybody has a place and a purpose and a plan and that uh, they are worth believing in and they are worth, again, giving that call to adventure so they, they can become the heroes, you know? I don't know if that makes yeah. sense, but yeah. I absolutely love that. You brought up a, a really interesting point. I think that we live in a world, in a world of social media, it's very easy for us to compare ourselves to other people. Yeah. To see the achievements of friends or family members or, or people that we don't even know. Absolutely. And to say, you know, their life is so perfect. Why is my life not like that? It's almost like we see others as the hero of their own stories, but yet we forget to create our own stories. We're, we're so busy trying to vicariously live through the lives of other people that we forget to create our own stories. Why do you think it's so important to not compare ourselves to other people and just to focus on our own story? I mean, I think primarily because a lot of those, you know, stories aren't real. Those aren't those people's stories. I think that uh, people forget that the fantasy land in which most of us spend most of our time is social media. Like it's not reality. It looks like reality and there are bits of reality in it, just like there are bits of reality in the world in Middle Earth or in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. It looks kind of like reality, but it's not real. Social media is not a real thing. It's not a real place. It is, again, a place where we spend a lot of our times, but we need to remember that it is fictional, right? Now, it's not a bad thing to have fictional worlds. Um, and spend our time there. It's just uh, important that those don't <laughs> take priority over our real life, you know, because it, it's easy to, to let social media seem like the reality outside of it is just kind of boring or not, um, not as flashy, not as colorful, not as adventurous, not as important. Um, and that's not always true. I, I think a really good movement of positivity and good stuff in social media is growing every day. Um, and I think that there are a lot of creators out there that are using it to further just wonderful messages and ideas and helping each other. And connection is always a good thing, right? Connection can always be a good thing if it helps people find like-minded people and it, it helps them tell their stories and stuff. But I think, uh, yeah, if you're forgetting to live your own story, there's a problem. No matter what's distracting you, whether it's social media or anything else. And uh, that's kind of the point, right? Are we going to spend our whole lives someday getting around to the adventure that is ourselves, that is discovering ourselves, that is living, um, that is living boldly and bravely, but also so lovingly and kindly, you know, that adventure is always waiting for us. It's always around the corner. We just need to listen to the call and, and follow it, you know, when that Gandalf or that Obi-Wan or that Hagrid or, or, you know, what be it comes to you and invites you on that adventure. Are you going to go? Hmm. I think that so many people postpone their dreams for so long. And it makes me so sad to see yeah. that. And I, I know that I've done that. I mean, totally. even this podcast, <laughs> I've been wanting to have a podcast for years and years. And, and here I, we are. And you're right. And eventually we got here. <laughs> yeah. But I'm just, I'm kind of sad that I didn't start this earlier because this was sure. a dream that I had for a long time. And finally, you know, I, I had the, the final nudge to, to do it. But I think that so often as humans, we have this dream, we have this goal, we have something that we're really looking forward to, but either out of fear or, or a plethora of other reasons, we decide decide to hold off and to postpone yeah. and to not pursue those dreams or adventures that we're wanting to have. Totally. And for me, I kind of have different like sections. Like there's a lot of stuff I would like to do. Um, and I try to do as many of those as is possible. Right. But you have priorities and sometimes like some things that you do make other things not possible in life. And that's okay because you have your priorities of those things like, uh, um, you know, having a family might make it so you travel less, but also maybe it doesn't have to, maybe you think it does, but it actually just requires more planning to put it in its right place. And, uh, but I think all of us have things we know we're meant to do. You know, that inward, you, that inward smile, that inward, like knowing, like, this is what I meant to do. And we're afraid sometimes you could almost call it a destiny. Yeah, totally. Um, and you can ignore that and you can bury it. And I think that you can live throughout your life and not do those things. But I think that when you are brave or, you know, sometimes it's uncomfortable and sometimes it's hard and difficult, like you were saying, and we're scared of that. Um, that quote, you know that quote where everybody says like, our greatest fear isn't like, 
our greatest fear isn't that like we're not meant for greatness it's that we'll succeed past our wildest expectation you know that quote mm-hmm. you've ever yeah. heard yeah. i've always heard that and i'm like what the heck no that's not like why are people saying that quote over and over again nobody's scared to be successful if i said to any single human being like hey i'll give you a million subscribers on youtube right now i don't know anybody that wouldn't take it because they don't have to do anything with it. Or if I was like, here's a million dollars, somebody's not gonna be like, no, I'm afraid of my own potential. I'm not gonna take that million dollars. <laughs> like that's not gonna happen. What I think it is, is that they're afraid of how hard it's going to be to live up to their potential. Because when you're actually operating at your like full self capacity, which is different for everybody and changes day to day, um, it's not an easy thing. It's an uncomfortable thing. It's like when Gandalf comes up to Bilbo and he's like, I'm looking for someone who wishes to share an adventure. Bilbo says, oh, adventures are nasty things. They make you late for dinner, cold and wet. I don't want any of that. But then this adventure that he ends up going on defines him as a human being. So I think when the call to adventure comes, there's this part in all of these stories where they reject the call. It's, uh, and I think what's happening is they, inside, they know how difficult that's gonna be. When I knew I needed to make films, which eventually led to everything we're doing with Thunder Feather and everything like that, it was in 2016, I was sitting on a tree in Santa Barbara, California on UCSB campus, looking out over the ocean and looking at the Channel Islands and I heard ravens calling around me and all of these things are like symbols for me. I realized I had had the thought years earlier that I needed to go into film, but I think I knew how difficult it was gonna be. And I think I knew what sacrifice, deep down I knew what sacrifices I would have to make. But finally at that moment, I could not deny anymore that that was the adventure that was calling me. And I was like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna do it. So I think that, uh, that we do know inside that greatness is difficult. But I also know that the difficult things that are part of your plan of becoming who you need to be are things that you can do. And you will be blown away what you are able to accomplish in life. When you look back and you're like, I can't believe that worked out the way it did. I can't believe we did that. I can't believe I was able to do that. It's all because you do things because you're scared, right? That's what bravery is. Bravery and courage is not the absence of fear, but doing it even though you're afraid, you know? Um, so I forgot I what the question was. But. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I think there's this concept called fake it till you make it. And that's something that I truly believe in. I remember one of my first shoots that I had when I started my video production company yeah. was for the One Voice Children's Choir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the biggest <laughs> shoot that I had done up until that point. Totally. They hi- hired me to do this shoot and they said, hey, uh, you're going to come to this place. You're going to be in charge of like 100 kids and then like 50 parents who are at your disposal yeah. to help <laughs> with anything. And I was just like, oh boy, I honestly like, I feel like I kind of know my stuff but in reality i have no idea what the heck i'm doing <laughs> so i show up to this place it's this beautiful place called the spiral jetty up in Northern yeah Utah. yeah <laughs> and um i end up filming this music video just kind of trying my hardest but also like not really knowing what i'm doing we end up making the video it's it it ends up getting out on youtube and now it has over 100 million views that video does yeah and it's just so interesting thinking back onto that because i remember being terrified i remember thinking i have no idea what in the world that i'm doing but i'm just gonna take the step i'm going there's there's this concept of being in motion i feel like so many people are so scared to take that first step totally but once they once they do the motion begins. And once you start being in motion, then I feel like the momentum kind of helps you and brings you to a place that you never thought that you could be before, but you have to take that first step. Totally. And uh, I think I love the idea of the fact that like you were willing to make it, you know, you weren't planning on faking it the whole time. You were doing what you needed to get to uh, this point right now where, where you are essentially, you know, the, the guy in the state to do this sort of thing. And it all started right there with this kind of just brave moment. And uh, yeah, it makes me think that like our fear of failure is sometimes crippling because failure is terrifying. And failure is something nobody wants to go through, but it is something that every single human being is going to go through so many times. And I remember that like our very first film we made on just like borrowed cameras, it was a short film and it would have made sense to a lot of people and to myself to wait longer to make my first film, right? Till I was a little bit more experienced or whatever, but I knew it was the right time. And so that was the difference. Like I just knew it was the right thing to do. And so we had all this equipment. We didn't know what we were doing and everything. And so like that first one, the production value is like, it's, it's 
sufficient. It's okay. You know what I mean? But the performance blew me away what these actors were supposed to do. And, and in this film, a majority of the actors are on the autism spectrum. And that's been the thing for all of our other films. And I just remember that like, I learned so much from that experience that if I would have been putting it off for longer, I would have been putting off some failures that I needed to make in order to learn. And so I've actually come to a point in my life where I love failing. I love trying something and failing now because I learned so much through it and I failed more times than I can count. And I used to be terrified of failure. I would work and work until I was pretty dang sure I wasn't gonna fail at something before I attempted it. And that held my development back significantly. When I started just like failing at stuff and being like, yeah, that's embarrassing, that's vulnerable, I'm gonna do it. And I'm probably gonna fail, but I might not. I might not fail. And because of that might not, it's worth trying. And what's cool is that all those failures actually come back around and end up having significance. Mm -hmm. Not even just as lessons later in life, but there'll be something like a skill that I need that I'm like, oh, I, I actually know how to do that because I tried this thing. Because I failed with it that before. totally failed. And now I know the basics of it, you know? And so I think that like that fear of failure is holding, holding people back. Whereas like, bro, you're gonna fail. You're gonna fail hundreds and thousands of times in your lifetime. Get started on it, you know? And failing is, is actually, it's, it's, so human you know what i mean yeah. when you fail at something don't you feel so human you do don't you feel so like oh man like i have stuff to learn and i respect people that do this so much more and i respect myself so much more because of what i tried and this hurts but i'm gonna go heal and take the time to heal and come back stronger yeah like that's what failure is you know i feel like failure is so authentic and it's so genuine and that's something that we don't see a lot of nowadays yeah. especially with social media we have to be perfect with, with social media nobody's posting their failures totally everybody is just posting the, the <laughs> highlight reels of their life and so then it's yeah. another thing that makes it really unhealthy when we look at that yep. we compare ourselves to them thinking nobody else has failures totally when in reality the failures are what defines us the yeah. failures are what makes us who we are and to be honest the reason why i think that we're here on earth yeah is to absolutely. fail and and then to learn and then to grow and mm -hmm. then to keep failing and keep learning and keep growing. And it's a never ending cycle. I, I totally agree with that. I think that, uh, you know, failure and challenge is what makes us strong. Just like, you know, um, you go to the gym. If you lift really light weights that you're really good at lifting, you're not really going to get stronger. But if you're lifting things that are a little too heavy for you, you know, to where you fail on the last set or whatever, that's, that's when the true growth is. And so, in the same way, like, I think I'm going to look back at my 20s as a very interesting time because of the amount of failure. Uh, it was more than I thought it was going to be. It was more than I would have chosen. Um, it seems like more than other people because of that social media effect, like you were saying. But like, I, I think I'm going to go on to be so, so incredibly grateful for all of those failures because it did something to me. It hardened me. It quenched something in me while at the same time, softened things in me too, made me way, way more understanding of certain situations and what th things that people are going through and challenges that other people are going through when other people fail. If you never fail, you will never be able to look upon failure in other people in like a kind or forgiving or, or generous way. You know what I mean? Because you haven't been there. And so, yeah, I think it's, I think failure is just a beautiful wonderful thing and that without failure we don't we we don't get some of the spectacular you know heights that you can reach as a human being they don't mean as much if it's not at risk you know i totally agree yeah so earlier you said that one of your purposes in life is to become a hero maker sure yeah yeah right now you're working on a very special creative project called thunder feather true i'd love yeah. to hear a little bit more about that and and how you are able to make heroes out of the people that you are working with on this film absolutely thanks thanks for asking so thunder feather is the result of a lot of introspection a lot of adventure and a lot of failure so everything that we've kind of been talking about um a lot of calls to adventure um what's crazy about thunder feather is that i did not set out to make thunder feather happen at all it was brought about in like the craziest roundabout way but because i was following just the next step that i knew i needed to follow uh, thunder feather is a nonprofit, 501c3 organization here in utah that seeks to make films well its actual mission is uh, discovering potential through arts creativity in film 
And it specifically tries to make films um, that are neurodivergent or that feature people that are neurodivergent. Um, and that term is for anybody that is autistic, has ADHD, OCD. Um, it's applied a lot of times to people with mental illness and other things. Um, I have ADHD myself, I'm not autistic. Um, and I wasn't diagnosed until I was 25. That's a separate story uh, that I that we can talk about sometime. But um, the way Thunderfeather happened was crazy. I knew I needed to make movies, that's it. So I worked on that. I started writing the first one and I realized my main character was autistic. That was just part of his character. For those of you that write stories, sometimes the characters just introduce themselves. They show up and they're like, hey, I'm the protagonist of your story. And you're like, cool, okay. What do you want to do? <laughs> and uh, that's the moment where I was like, okay, usually a neurotypical person plays someone with autism in a film, right? And I was like, huh, I wonder if there'd be anybody out there on the spectrum that would want to be in this movie. I don't know. I don't know if they'd be interested in it, if that'd be something people would want to do. So I was like, let's just have auditions before I wrote the story. The story was like the skeleton of the story was there. So we held auditions. 10 seconds into the first one, I was like, this is it. This is it, this is incredible. We just, and, and it was a different kind of audition. They didn't come with a scene prepared or anything. We just sat down and I let them know this was gonna happen beforehand. We just sat down to do an improvised scene if they were comfortable with it. And we just sat down and I had a bunch of scenes in my brain that we would do. I say, okay, you are Bigfoot and I'm a guy and we're sitting around a campfire. Let's talk about our day, you know? Or sometimes I would base it on Star Wars or something that they liked a lot, you know? So they felt comfortable doing it. And uh, they were incredible. They were incredible right out of the bat. And I realized that it was really cool because I realized that this story wasn't my story anymore. It was a story that we were gonna make together. And I learned that about directing. You know, I've learned a lot about directing since then. And I, I learned that, you, you know, you're writing a book, you kind of figure out all the parts yourself. But at Thunderfeather now, the, the things that we make are so collaborative and everybody adds their own bit to it. And it's so cool that I'm just finding the right people to put in the right spot. So we made that first film. I went to festivals internationally. People really liked it. We made a second one. We made a third one. We made a fourth one. And uh, then I wondered if I was if it was over, if I did what I had set out to do, because I, it was hard, you know, it was a lot of sacrifice, a lot of my own funds, stuff like that. I hate asking people for money more than anything else on the planet. So that's when we had a Kickstarter because I felt like we needed to do a Kickstarter, which was the last thing I wanted to do. And that was miraculous. I think we made like a third of our funds in the last four hours. And that gave us enough to make the movie. And then I was like, oh, I don't really want to pay taxes on all of this, but I'm going to have to. Maybe this should be a nonprofit. And I went to a, a nonprofit that I've been volunteering with for about a decade that does children's theater to ask him for advice. And they said, okay, well, in our nonprofit, we have nurture groups. So you could submit a proposal to our board. And if they say, okay, then we'll kind of adopt you as a nurture group because your mission fits with our mission. I was like, you could do that. And they're like, yeah, yeah, you could do that. So I submitted this petition. I was really nervous about it and it was unanimously accepted. So uh, we're coming up on a year where we've been an official operating as an official 501c3. We're working on a feature film called Stories from Another World, a collection of interdimensional fairy tales. It's an anthology. Uh, so a collection of five different short stories. Uh, one's about an ogre who goes on a road trip to find the best sandwich in the universe. Uh, and he meets witches and mermaids and all these fantastical things. One's about a robot, super in the future. She's the first robot with human emotions, so she has to escape this evil corporation. Another one's about a superhero who is going to orientation, but he thinks there's a supervillain in his company, so he kind of films it, so it's like found footage. Um, another section is about three girls in the 90s who battle monsters in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and all of those stories came about because I wrote them for the people that came in and auditioned. So the actors on the spectrum, it was written around what they want to do. Oh, there's one more, pirates. There's one about pirates whose ocean dried up so their ships go around on wheels. It's kind of steampunky. And then all of these stories are told by an interdimensional researcher named John Cornish, who's actually in real life a great, great, great grandfather of mine, I think. So it's like half fictional, half real coming together. Um, wild premise i know interdimensional fiction is kind of new but it's getting more popular but most of all i wanted to create a movie that allowed 
these actors to play parts that they always wanted to and to play parts that they were comfortable with because they performed the best that way. And making movies with Thunder Feather is different from making movies any other way. I've been on movie sets as an actor and in other roles, independent all the way up to big, big budget stuff, right? They're the most like disorganized, craziest things, not really a conducive environment for somebody that's uh, neurodivergent. So it's been really interesting to create a set where people feel comfortable where they feel like they could come up and say, hey, I'm kind of having a panic attack. And me as the director, I'm not gonna be like, oh, we have this schedule and this money we're losing. I can just stop and say, hey, I'm, I'm here with you. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anybody else. What do you need? What can we do? And uh, there's been some really, really cool things that have happened um, because of that kind of environment we've been able to make and just some spectacular acting. Um, and storytelling and some really cool worlds we've been able to, to build together. It's like the coolest thing I've ever done or been a part of. And it only happened because I listened to what the next step was going to be. I had no idea what Thunderfeather would turn into when I felt that I needed to make movies. But I was just open and ready to just take leaps and fail and do that sort of stuff. So... Yeah, it's, it's really cool because a lot of these people would never have the opportunity to be in movies, uh, whether it's just because, you know, prejudice against people with autism or even just like, you know, money. If a director is just like, oh, I would love to cast you, but it would just be a little more expensive to accommodate your needs, you know? And that's something I wanted to change. I wanted to change the way movies are made. I wanted to change the opportunities the neurodivergent people have. Um, our world isn't built for neurodivergent people. It's built for neurotypical people because that's how most of most people are neurotypical. So taxes and school and schedules and everything like that um, are a lot easier for neurotypical people than they are for neurodivergent people. It's kind of just hard to live sometimes. So I wanted to increase, opportunity, uh, increase opportunities for people in that um, situation because man, <laughs> I just can't think anything worse of a kid who's like, I want to be an actor. And the world says, ah, oh, but you have autism. Sorry, it's not going to work out. Mm. That's just wrong. And I want to make a world where that doesn't happen and that doesn't happen for other people in other situations. You know what I mean? So anyway, I yeah, I'm a bit, big advocate for just projects that increase opportunities for people that don't have them. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> Sorry, that was, I know that was a long no, no, description. That was great. <laughs> I feel like you have a very particular mindset that not a lot of people have. And I want to kind of dive deep into what gave you that mindset. And, and there's something, there's there's a, a path that I want to go down that, okay. that I, I've kind of figured out why you have this mindset, but I think it'd be cool to you kind figured of explore out why I have this. the mindset? Okay. Yeah, I think it'd be kind of cool to explore this a, l a little bit more. We talked a little bit about this at the very beginning of the podcast. Yeah. And, um, and that was basically living with the same kind of sense of wonder that you had as a child. Okay, yeah. And how like in, in society, we're taught that as you grow up, you have to become an adult and be serious and not dream and not adventure anymore. So I, I kind of want to transition into mythological creatures. Okay. Talking yeah. about them, talking <laughs> about uh, fairies and <laughs> mermaids and Bigfoot and, and there's so many out there. Yeah. But I remember- Dragons. Right. I, I remember a very specific uh, one day. I remember you came up to me. I, I think this might have been when we were roommates or <laughs> yeah. when we were in the car. We or something. were roommates one time, by the way. We were. It was a great time. It was. We had a fun time. It was awesome. Our other roommates were ridiculous. <laughs> I loved them. Yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> but I remember one day you came up to me and you asked me a very interesting question. You said, hey, Nick, do you believe in fairies? And I remember kind of looking at you with kind of this weird look. And I was like, no, I, I, I don't think so. And you're like, why not? And I was like, well, I just, I don't know. I've just kind of been taught and conditioned that they're not real. And, and you were like, well, have you ever seen one? And I was like, no. And you said, well, does that mean that they're not real? And I was like, well, I guess not. And you were like, look, I believe in fairies because why not? You're like, you know, when you're a kid and you believe in everything, you believe in Santa Claus, the tooth fairy, the Easter bunny, and it just makes life more of an adventure. Yeah. And then as you grow older, you stop believing in things and life just kind of becomes more boring. And then you said, I like to live my life believing that things are real because it makes life more of an adventure. And you're like, well, maybe, you know, who, who knows? Maybe someday I'll die and get to heaven and God is like, no, fairies aren't real. 
And you'd be like, great, no harm done. It didn't affect my relationship with anyone. It was just a fun little thing that I had. But you're like, what if, what if I die and get to heaven and God is like, Levi, fairies are fairies totally real. freaking real. <laughs> then you'd be like, yes, I knew it. <laughs> so you're like, what's, what's the harm in doing that? For me, it just turns into a giant game of hide and seek whenever I go out into the forest and I'm like, I'm yeah. here to find Super you. And the fun. fairies are like, oh no, he's out to get us. And it just turns into this fun thing. And so I want to kind of just explore that idea yeah. a little bit more about the idea of belief. Believing totally. in other things, even though they may or may not exist. Believing in yourself, even though it may or may, even though your dreams may or may not happen. Yeah. Yeah. but they definitely won't happen if the belief isn't there. Totally. That's that's great. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening right now are having the same reaction you had when I said that thing. Um, and they're probably thinking like, okay, wait a second. I need to think about everything this guy said because he believes in fairies. And what I should say <laughs> is, I should clarify that like <laughs> mythological creatures for me are just like, I'm not shutting the door on all of them, mm. right? Fairies, I'll tell you why. Specifically that one, I'm like, I think fairies are real. But most mythological creatures, I'm like, I don't know. I'm just not going to say no. Because we've been conditioned in life to say that things aren't real if we don't have direct evidence of them. And that's a really good like practice in medicine and some other fields of science, right? But like for how you live your life, you know, like how could you believe in yourself and your future? You don't have any evidence of that. And so, um, you know, our universe is incredibly vast and undiscovered, and we understand so little about it. In fact, 97% of everything that exists, we can't even, you know, it's dark energy, dark energy and dark matter, and we can't even like pick most of this stuff up with any instruments that we have, can't even find it anywhere, we just know it's there, according to the math, right, and the physics. So most of reality we can't detect at all. So I like to just have the idea that like, I can never say something's not possible or not real, um, because who am I to say that? I'm just a human being with my powers of perception. So um, for me, it's fun to believe in mythological creatures that somehow they could be real. Maybe it's some interdimensional thing. Maybe it's, I don't know, like somewhere in the universe, somehow something could be real. So I'm not going to say it's not. And it doesn't make life more interesting. It does make life more fun. But the fairy story specifically is my brother comes home when I'm a teenager, right? And he tells me about this friend, right? This other friend um, who can tell this story if you ever interview them, but I won't say their name just in case they want to tell the story. Uh, and it's a friend that we had had for a while. And he said, hey, did you know this guy? He believes in fairies. And I had that. I was like, what? Bro, fairies? Like of all the things, fairies. For real? And I had that feeling. And my brother just looks at me and he's like, yeah, I believe him. Because why not? I mean, I don't think he's a liar. And I was like, oh, so I either have to hold on to this weird worldview that I for some reason have and decide that my friend is lying or I can open my mind a little bit because this friend said that they saw one and that sounds ridiculous and that sounds crazy, but I don't know. I just decided that in that moment, I wasn't going to think automatically that that person was a liar again, to support my closed-minded worldview. So I was like, you know what? I don't think he's lying. Maybe they are real. Maybe they are. I don't know. And uh, yeah, I don't know. That has led to a lot of things, you know, in life. Like, like magical creatures, I like going to the woods and hunting for them. And I like making theories about how they could be real. And it, it just... And how birds can be government spies. <laughs> it's, you know, I just... I think it's important to know truth and to know reality. Those are important things to search for, right? It's important thing. It's important to verify what is objectively real and what is not objectively real and to live in line with what is true because nobody wants to live a delusion. That can be very dangerous when you're living a delusion um, because there are some very dangerous delusions out there like that some races aren't as good as other races. That can lead to a lot of bad stuff or that you know some people shouldn't have as much rights as others or that there are ways to fix certain diseases outside of just the generally accepted things that work in, in science and medicine. And so, but the thing is thinking that there could be fairies in the woods makes it funner to go in the woods, makes it funner to live on earth to say, I don't know, could be, 
I'm not saying yes. I'm not saying no. I'm just saying I don't have to have an opinion on that. And uh, we have been conditioned to have an opinion on everything. Hmm. We've been conditioned through just the way culture is. We have to have an opinion on everything, whether it's a political thing or whatever. We have to be like, well, I think this or I think that. I don't know, man. There are so many things I don't know. There are so many things I'm undecided about. There are so many things I have no idea about, and I am content with that because there are things I do know. There are things I am absolutely certain about. And that's all I got to worry about. You know what I mean? Like, like again, the universe is vast. I'm never going to know everything about it in this life. So I may as well just keep an open mind. And I think keeping an open mind is extremely um, important and healthy because when things become mutually exclusive, then uh, we run into difficulties. You know what I mean? I don't know if that explained it totally. well enough, yeah. but uh, I could talk a little bit about the childhood aspect of it, if you'd like. Sure. And this is something that I feel um, good about saying. Uh, for those of you who are aware, in uh, in our religion, we have something called the patriarchal blessing, which is essentially a very, very special blessing that you get um, once in your life that gives you direction for the rest of your life, right? And uh, we believe that it's you know given to us um, from God and that it has just some advice. It's not like like fortune telling or anything. It's just advice, right? One of the things in there that I feel good about sharing with everybody right now is that mine says, always remember your childhood and the lessons you learned. Like it specifically talks about my childhood and not to let it go. And I found that, you know, as we were talking earlier, there's so much magic in your childhood when you enter this new world. And this new world is so interesting. And there's so many mysteries to solve. And there's so many things to see and people to meet and things to do. And then we learn a little bit later as we're growing up that, oh, there are bad stuff too. Really, really bad things. Horrible, horrible bad things in the world. Just atrociously bad elements of being alive on this planet. Things that, you know, don't, that nobody deserves to go through. You know, and we learn those things and then our perception of the world maybe changes. It loses some of its magic. It loses some of its value as a, as a place of adventure. It loses its safety for sure. And we take that sometimes a little too far, I think. And the world becomes kind of this kind of dull place for a lot of people. And I think that's wrong. Because I think though the good stuff in life doesn't necessarily make the bad stuff better, the bad stuff's just bad. The bad stuff doesn't doesn't also make the good stuff worse. It's still just good. And nothing can take away from the fact that it is just good. And so I've tried really hard to hold on and rediscover over and over that magic from my childhood because it is so easy to see the world as a spectacular place as a child. It's a lot harder after you've gone through hard stuff. But the kind of people that are able to see the world as a magical, adventurous place while also realizing and knowing deeply and intimately how just terrible it can be sometimes, those are heroes. If you want to know the definition of a hero, it's somebody who chooses to keep that good with them after knowing the bad, you know? And uh, it's not easy. It's really not an easy thing. And, and the, the disappointment that you feel as a kid, when you learn about the horrible things in the world, that's real. But it's so worth rediscovering that magic, man. It, it really is because, you know, that bad stuff, we're working as hard as we can to make it go away. Again, as a society, as a culture, I think that's our goal, right? We are ending suffering for each other and we're helping each other rise above things and, you know, disease and death, conquering those things should be our priority as a species. But I think that we need a reason to do those things. And the reasons to do those things are how spectacular existence can be, how absolutely indescribably incredible being alive can be. You know, breathing every day, seeing a sunset, the little things, the big things, um, appreciating those things for the beauty that they are, I think changes the way we see the world. And so that's one of the reasons why I've sought to hold on to adventure and magic and fairies and treasure hunting and you know, archaeology and film and myths and legends and writing and all of these things that um, at different points in my life, people have told me or I've told myself that it's not worth it, that that's not being responsible, that that's not being smart or 
not very grown up of me to do. Um, and I think that responsibility is an incredibly important skill to have and organization is and self-control and all the things that you need to learn to live in this world are incredibly important things to have habits and making those habits and setting goals and reaching goals. All of that stuff is incredibly important. And none of that stuff means that you can't go and have a magical adventure that you can't decide like, you know what, this weekend I'm going to go on a road trip instead. It might be a short road trip, but I'm going to go do something I've never done before. And that's one of my favorite definitions of adventure isn't traveling to a different country or, you know, fighting a dragon, though it can be. <laughs> it's not necessarily those things. For me, an adventure is simply doing something you've never done before or in a way that you've never done it before, even if it's the same thing. Um, it can be reading a new book, meeting somebody new, walking a different way to school. You know, it can be, again, going on a road trip one person over. It can be going fairy hunting in the woods, learning about the local species of plants that are edible in the mountain right by your house and learning wilderness survival skills. It can be, um, you know, writing poems because you've never written poems before and you're going to try that out. It can be starting a podcast. It can be starting a business. It can be anything. And I think that adventures nowadays on social media are always oh, I'm on an island, look at this selfie I took. And we think of like, I love to go on adventures. What adventure truly means to me is that. Getting out of your comfort zone, doing something you've never done before, exercising a little bit of bravery, curiosity, imagination. Um, and that's why I think adventure is, you know, one of the most important parts of being a human. And it's like a vitamin that we need, you know. And again, doesn't require anything other than just the stuff that you're already doing every day, maybe in a little bit of a different way, you know? So I don't know. Sometimes I have a roundabout way of saying things and I hope that some of this, you'll be able to edit off all the extra fluff. Hopefully. No, I don't, I don't think I'm going to edit any of that. In fact, I think, I think that that is a fantastic way to end and, and place to end this podcast is just saying that the world is more of a magical place than we know. Yeah. And that, may not necessarily mean Harry Potter magic, even though we're not ruling that out. It's possible that that magic does exist. I mean, but not going to say no. Yeah. But I, I, I think that the world is more of an incredible place than we realize. And I think that saying no to things, I think that limiting ourselves and I think not believing in the things that we're capable of doing yeah. will make it so that we're not able to see that magic. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you again for coming on to the podcast. Where, where can people find you? Um, go ahead and plug any of your social media or any of the stuff that you're working on that people can find and help out with if, if uh, you'd like sure, to plug that. Sure, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say thunderfeather.org is the main website. And uh, also we have at thunderfeather on TikTok. I can't remember exactly what the Instagram's called, but it's pretty easy to find with Thunderfeather film something. Um, yeah, so so yeah, on our on our website thunderfeather.org, you can find pretty much everything. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the <laughs> podcast. Uh, for the audience listening, make sure you guys comment below. Let us know your favorite part of this podcast, and let us know if you'd like to have Levi back on the podcast because I think that he's definitely a guest that I would love to have back on the podcast. So other as than long that, as make it's sure not on a full moon night. Correct. Yep. We he, might have a very different character. Very in case. different. So make sure to, <laughs> to like, comment below, subscribe if you want to listen to more of these, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Waka waka doo doo, yeah. Awesome, man. It was Landon. Landon saw the fairy. <laughs> 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 <laughs>